are church planters to the faraway land of Boulder, Colorado. And so uh, let me just start off by asking this. How many of you have been to Boulder before? Okay, a good number of you. You never know. You're almost in Kansas here, so you just never know if, if folks down here have made their way up to the city or if the city is just, they can stay to themselves and you just like it out here. You know, you never know. So many of you know what Boulder is like. You know a lot about Boulder's history. Um, but Boulder is a city that is one of our most liberal cities in America now. It was a, a hippie town back in the 60s and into the 70s, and there's still a lot of uh, hippie remnants there as well. You'll still see buses with curtains around the windows, you know, that indicate people are living in there. There's still a lot of uh, man buns and tie-dye shirts and all that, and and then there's also, of course, the, uh, the prevalence of the LGBT community there. Um, it's, it's very, that lifestyle is very much paraded and celebrated in Boulder, as is uh, marijuana and, and everything that goes along with that. Now, Boulder is also a, you know, as we look at Boulder, it's a beautiful place. It's one of the most beautiful cities, uh, I believe, in all of America to go to. And yet in such a beautiful place, it's in a place that has been known as one of the happiest and healthiest cities in America, there's a side to Boulder that many people haven't seen. It's a very broken city. There's a large homeless population in Boulder. There's a lot of drug abuse there as well that's contributed to the homelessness. I mean, as I was uh, working for the Sherman Williams Paint Company in Boulder, we would see people come down Valmont Road and they're just, they're strung out on something. And you'd see them yelling and screaming at nobody. And so you'd see that there. I would go and throw our, our uh, trash in the dumpster closure and you'd see needles and other kind of drug paraphernalia right there in the alleyway. And You'd sweep it up and throw it away and then go back just a couple days later and it was all right there again. And so it's a place that is really broken by sin. And you might just look at, at our country and we know that our country is becoming more and more like Boulder as a nation in general. But as you look at a place that was once uh, just a, a Christian nation here in the United States of America, now you see the direction that our country is going. When you look at the history of Boulder, it has been a place that has had the gospel truth. That in its very early days, uh, Chautauqua Park that rests there right against the Flatirons used to serve as a Christian retreat center for Texas cattle ranchers. That in the heat of summer, they would drive their cattle up into the Rockies and they would settle there right in the city of Boulder and uh, they'd have circuit riding preachers come through and they'd set up camp there and they'd receive messages from the Word of God. And that's, that was in the very early days of the city of Boulder. And that might seem completely foreign to that city these days. Our family moved to Longmont, Colorado in 1995 and started Rocky Mountain Bible Baptist Church. And uh, when we started our church, there were three independent Baptist churches there in the city of Boulder preaching the gospel, perpetuating biblical faith in that area, and yet over the course of time, for whatever reason, since 2005, there's not been a single independent fundamental Baptist church in the city of Boulder. And as a result of a place that had gospel truth and rejected it, what's left there now is a city of 107,000 people where over 66,000 are professing atheists. I mean, just consider that number. That's nearly two out of every three people you meet don't even believe in God. That's here in the United States of America. That's right in your backyard in the city of Boulder, about four hours from here. And so it's a place that is in desperate need of a gospel witness. And God called us to go there. It's been about 10 years ago that God first spoke to my heart about going to the city of Boulder. And God has done so much in my heart uh, through the scriptures that have just showed me that God was able to save people out of the same kinds of cultures that is in Boulder all the way back in the first century in places like Corinth and Antioch and Rome. These cities that were really despots of morality back in the first century, God raised up great churches in those cultures. And so God has done a work in our hearts to show us that he's more than willing to work 
if we'll be willing to surrender and go. And so we've been on deputation raising support for this work since last January. And Lord willing, we'll finish that up at the end of April. And we'll spend the month of May knocking doors and trying to set up Bible studies with people. And then God willing, our startup date is set for June the 6th. So if you'll be in prayer for us, we know that Boulder is a city that uh, if any work's going to be done there, it's got to be bathed and rooted in prayer. And so I just ask if at the end of the service, if you pick up one of our prayer cards off the table, and if you just pray for our family and pray for the city of Boulder, that God will do a great work. And so at this time, we'll uh, get the video started, and that will tell you a lot more really about the culture of Boulder, and then we'll get into the Word of God tonight. Are we good to go?
Again, I'll ask you to pray for us. Um, there's a great need there, but we know that we serve a great God, a God who is, uh, his, his gospel is able to pierce through the hardest of hearts and the most vilest of sinners to bring them to their knees before Jesus Christ in salvation. And so we're praying to see God do that over and over again. I'll invite you to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 10. The book of Acts in chapter number 10 perhaps might be a familiar portion of Scripture to you, um, but I pray that God will use the message tonight to stir in our hearts about the world around us that needs to be saved. And so Acts chapter number 10, and it's a little bit of a lengthy uh, portion of Scripture we're going to be covering, so we'll jump around a little bit, I'll do some explaining, but we're going to be covering verses 1 through verse 28. So we'll begin our reading in Acts chapter 10 and verse 1. The Bible says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people, and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And so then he tells him to send men to the city of Joppa, to the house of a man named Simon the Tanner by the seaside, and that he was to call for a man named Simon, and specifically, and what you'll find as you read on is that he wanted Simon, that, that Simon Peter had a specific message that Cornelius needed to hear. And so God is orchestrating something here, and he's, he's telling Cornelius to send men for Simon and Peter, and at the same time, God is doing a work in Peter's life. Look at verse 9. It says, On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto, their, uh, unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God has that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again to heaven. And so then Peter is wondering what in the world this vision is all about. And at the time that he's wondering about it, the men that Cornelius sent from Caesarea to Joppa had come to Peter's door, and, and so they talked to Peter, and they explained to him what was going on, that, that God had sent an angel to Cornelius, and that he was to call for Simon Peter. And uh, if you'll look specifically at the end of verse number 22, it says that they were to hear words of thee. That was why he sent for Peter. So Peter goes back with them, and if you look at verse 28, he comes to Caesarea and to Cornelius' house. And verse 28, as he's addressing the crowd, says this, And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. The title of the message tonight is this, Taking the Gospel to Unexpected Places. And so why don't we ask the Lord to bless and to help us understand the Word tonight, and then we'll get into the message. Our Father, we come to you tonight, and we acknowledge our need of you, that uh, Lord, without the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit, that we will struggle to understand the words of your Scripture and so I pray and ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, and that tonight we go away changed as we look into the mirror of God and His Word. Help us to see where we need to change. Help us to see the areas that need to be corrected. And God, may we go away transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. It's in His name I pray. Amen. When you consider uh, missions, when you consider church planting around the, the world, 
Uh, there are certain places that you might expect to bear fruit. You might expect to see a church planted. You might expect to see souls saved and just see God do a great work. Among those places would certainly be the country of the Philippines, uh, that there's a great evangelistic work going on there right now. I'd also say that Mexico is a ripe harvest field for the gospel. My wife's parents are missionaries in Mexico City, one of the most dangerous cities in the world. And, and when they started their first church about four or five years ago now, uh, in just a few years, their church was over, uh, over 200 people. They'd have 100 people out on Saturdays going out into the marketplaces and into the city telling people about the gospel. And most of the people that had been saved there were saved directly through their ministry. It's amazing. So there are parts all, all over the world where you see that happening. There are certain places in our country, certain regions. We might think more so of the southern conservative Bible Belt area, but you might go down there to start a church and you knock some doors. You might see people saved at the door. You might see uh, people join the church and you have a church going in a pretty quick period of time. And so there are certain places where if you hear that a missionary is going or you hear that a preacher is going to plant a church here in the U.S. that you would just think, well, they're going to do well there. That's going to be a good, a good place to start. But then there are certain people in certain places where, if we're honest, we don't expect to bear much fruit. Speaking of countries, you would consider maybe Russia would be a country like that. Or maybe India or, or Nepal or certainly a place like North Korea. That if somebody is called to go to North Korea and you hear that, you just know right off the bat, that's going to be a tough place to go. And there are cities that we could look at here in the United States of America where we would think the same way. I mean, uh, we make no bones about it. God's called us to go to Boulder. Can I tell you, as we've uh, been on deputation, specifically in Colorado for the first eight months of last year, that uh, there were several pastors here in our state that I told them we were going to Boulder, and they said, I'm so thankful that God called you to go there because it means I don't have to go there. And so that's, that's kind of our mindset. And you'd probably think the same way about New York City, about Seattle, Washington, or Portland, Oregon, or San Francisco, California. I mean, these very liberal cities here in our state. You know if somebody, and, and I imagine that there are some folks in here that as you find out we're going to Boulder, that you are probably thinking this in your mind. They've got their work cut out for them. That's going to be a tough place. A very atheistic culture. A lot of lifestyles there that are contrary to the Word of God. How are they going to reach those people? And so there are certain places that we look at and we just don't have the highest expectations, if we put it that way. But there are also specific groups of people where we would feel the same way. I mean, when you, when you find out that you're going to a place like Boulder, where there are, there's a large LGBT presence there, we don't always expect to bear much fruit among that crowd. We don't always expect to bear much fruit among the atheistic crowd or among the Muslims, or Hindus, or Buddhists, people that are steeped in religion, even Catholicism, that we would look at specific groups of people like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and gays and transgenders and all these things, and we would just think in the back of our minds, that is going to be a hard place to go. That is going to be a difficult people to reach. In fact, I don't even know how many of them this family will be able to reach. Don't we think that way? Am I alone? You know, when we would have missionaries come through, I would, there were certain places and certain people groups that I would just think that's going to be a difficult place to go. But you might also consider that you probably have some friends. You probably have some neighbors. You probably have some family members that you've tried to give the gospel to and you've tried to give it to them time after time again and they can just become so hard into it and so rejecting of it that you can begin to think if it's possible for them to even be saved. You've tried to give them the gospel, but they've refused it. Well, listen, is it not true that those people and those places where we don't expect them to receive the gospel are the very people and the very places that need it the most? That those cities, those countries, those groups of people are the way they are because they do not have the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so, but because of the difficulty and perhaps because of the expectation, we don't always take the gospel to some of the most needy parts of our world. In the Jewish mind, the Gentiles would have been the unexpected people in the unexpected places that God had called the church at Jerusalem to reach. He had commissioned them to go throughout Jerusalem and to then to reach Judea and to reach Samaria and ultimately to the uttermost part of the earth. And uh, by the time that we come to Acts chapter 10, they have reached out in the city of Jerusalem. They have started churches throughout the region of Judea. Philip went up to Samaria and communicated the gospel there and a church was raised up in Samaria. And so the last remaining place for the church at Jerusalem to go was to the uttermost part of the earth, which would be predominantly Gentile. Now, Peter in particular had an aversion to taking the gospel to the Gentile people. See, for his entire life, he lived in adherence not only with the Old Testament law, but also with the Talmud, which would be the oral traditions, or another way to say it would be man's application to God's teaching, which oftentimes their applications went above and beyond the spirit of the law. And so that's what, uh, what Peter grew up in. And God's intention was really for the Jews to be his light to the Gentiles, to show them the glory of God. But somewhere along the way, the Jews got this flipped upside down and they shut the Gentiles out. It became illegal to go out for a meal with a Gentile or to invite a Gentile into your home or at times to even talk to a Gentile. They weren't allowed into the temple. They were often viewed as dogs and as animals. They had no part in the promises of God. The Jews' hatred for the Gentiles only grew when Rome rose to power. Because as the Romans moved in and they began to handle God's people with tremendous brutality, it increased their hatred for the Gentiles and especially for Roman soldiers. And so if you really consider that cultural background, for the Apostle Peter going to a Roman city like Caesarea, To give the gospel to a Roman soldier named Cornelius was the last place on earth that Peter, as a Jew, expected to see himself going. And yet that was the very place that God was sending Peter to go. Why did God move Peter to take the gospel to Cornelius? To a place where he didn't expect to bear fruit. And why is God sending our family to a city like Boulder where really the expectations are pretty low? And why does God want you to continue to reach out to these specific groups of people, whether we're talking about political crowds or alternative lifestyles or atheists, agnostics, and skeptics? Why does God want us to reach out to them and give them the gospel? I believe that what we find in this account in Peter's life is going to help us to see why God wants us to reach these people. The first thing that I want you to see is that it was God who initiated the evangelistic endeavors here in Caesarea. In verse number one, we're introduced to a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius. We know that he was a man of position, as it says in verse one, that he was of the band called the Italian band. Now, what is that communicating? Well, when conquered the world at that time, that as they conquered nation to nation, they would assimilate their armies into the Roman army. And so you would have the Syrian band, and you would have the, uh, the, uh, the Assyrian band, and maybe you'd have the Israelite band. But this says that he was of the Italian band. That's telling us this. He was a Roman through and through. He grew up in a wicked, vile, Hellenistic society where wickedness ruled the streets, where idolatry and paganism is what permeated their society, that's what God is wanting us to see, is this man was a Roman Gentile to the core. But you know what? I'm thankful that God can save people out of those kind of cultures and out of those kind of lifestyles and out of that kind of religious system. And that's what God's at work to do in Cornelius' life here. We're told that he was a devout man. He was a very religious man that feared God with all his house. It says he gave much alms to the people there, verse 2, and he prayed to God 
always. So we know that, that Cornelius is also what many times in the New Testament you'll find a Gentile referred to as a God-fearer. It was somebody who was interested in the God of Israel, but because of the Jewish prejudices, prejudices against Gentiles, they were shut out. They weren't allowed into Judaism. They weren't, there were some that weren't allowed to convert to uh, the God of Israel because of that. And so this is a man who's very intrigued by the God of Israel and yet is held at an arm's distance. And so what happens here? In verse 3 it says, He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, the day an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius, hey listen to this, while the Jews shut Cornelius out, here's God's first message to him. I know your name. I know who you are. He says, and when he looked on him in verse 4, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. He says, God knows you by name, and he has taken note of who you are. He's heard every one of your prayers. He's seen every dime that you've given to His people. God has seen your goodness, your desire to know Him. But God also wants me to understand this, that prayers and almsgiving is not enough to save your soul. And so He tells him in verse number uh, 5, And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. In other words, your good work is enough. There's another message that you must hear if you are to know me. And so he tells them to uh, send, he sends these men up to, Caesarea, or up to Joppa to go and to call for Simon. What I want you to see here is that behind the scenes, God is at work sending a God-called man to a people who need to know about Jesus Christ. That's what God's doing. He's doing it behind the scenes in Cornelius' life. And while this is going on in Cornelius' life, he's also doing something in Peter's life. I just want to say this, that before the gospel goes out anywhere, before a church is raised up in any place, God is at work calling a man, shaping a man, preparing his family to go and take the gospel to people who need to know about Jesus Christ. And that's what God is doing here. In verse number 9, he's going to go to work on Peter's life. It says, On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the, unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And verse number 10 tells us that he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. A supernatural vision from God. And if you could put on your sanctified imagination right now, imagine with me, I mean, this is a strange thing. That, that Cornelius is on the rooftop praying. He's hungry. They're preparing the meal downstairs. And the aroma is coming up to the roof. And he's hungry. And so he's ready to go downstairs. But on his way there, the sky splits open. And descending from the sky is this great sheet knit at the four corners. And on this sheet were living, breathing animals. Now, how do you know that? Well, when I was a kid, I always envisioned this account as though it was like a kid's bed sheet that had little prints of, of lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. And so that's how I always thought of it. Uh, but, the, but the reality is, is that these were little animals. How do you know that? Because the voice cries out to him and says, Rise, Peter, kill me. How do you kill something that's dead? How do you eat something that's not, that's not ready to be killed and eaten? <laughs> And so this is weird. Now, if you ever had weird dreams, this tops them all. And so he's got these pigs and rabbits and camels and lizards and, and snakes and different things are, are climbing around on this thing. And, and, and the voice cries out to Peter and says, Peter, can't eat. But you know what Peter does? He, he objects. Oh Lord, for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. In other words, what he's saying is, those off limits. I can't have anything to do with those. I can't touch them. I can't taste them. No, I, they are unclean. So I'll not do this. 
And then God says this in verse 15, and the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. The Bible says this was done three times. He didn't get it the first time. And so God had to bring the sheet down again with the animals, and he spoke to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything that's common or unclean. And he said, What I have cleansed, that call not thou common. What I have made clean, you have no right to call it unclean. Now, the Bible says in verse 17 that Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. I imagine, you ever woken up from a bad dream or a weird dream and said, what was that about? Well, that's what's going on with Peter right now. He's thinking through in his mind, everything I've ever believed and done dietary-wise is being turned on its head right now by God himself. What in the world is this all about? And no sooner than he is questioning that, the knock comes at the door. The men sent from Cornelius to Joppa for Simon, they come to his house, and, and while they're there at the gate, the Spirit of God, in verse number uh, 19, it says, While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And so what the Spirit of God is telling him is, Peter, I am doing something. And you need to get on board with what I am doing. Don't doubt a thing. You go with these men. And so what Peter does is he goes down into the, he goes down to these men and he asks them what's going on and and uh, and, and they tell him and they explain to him that Cornelius is this great man and he he loves God and he loves the people of God and he wanted to he, that that a, an angel from God came and told him that he needed to hear a message from you. That's what they told him. See, what's at work here is that God is chipping away at Peter's life to get him to the place where he could effectively evangelize among the Gentiles. Here's what God did. The first thing that he did is he led Peter to the house of an unclean man. You'll notice three times in chapter 9, verse 43, chapter 10, verse 5, and uh, chapter 10, verse number 32, that Peter was lodging with a man by the name of Simon who was a tanner. Now, if you don't know what a tanner is, a tanner is somebody who produces leather out of animal skins. So it means that this guy was constantly dealing with day in day in and day out. He was dirty. He was bloody. He probably didn't smell real good. I mean, he was that kind of guy, a very dirty man. But Leviticus chapter 11, verses 39 and 40 tells us that those who deal with a dead carcass are unclean before God. And so what you see at work here is God has led Peter to the house of an unclean man. And then what God does is he gives Peter a vision of of unclean animals, only this time God says, what I have cleansed, you have no right to call unclean. And so you can see that God is chipping away at Peter's false notion that the gospel is limited to a particular group of people. That's what God is doing. And so he leads him to the house of Simon, the tanner. He gives him this vision of the unclean animals, and now the Spirit of God comes to him and says, I want you to go to a city that you always viewed as unclean. I want you to go to a man that you've always viewed as off limits. And I want you to preach the message of the gospel to them. And so Peter goes with these men. He takes some brothers from the church there at Joppa and, and he heads up to Caesarea. And the Bible says that he, he comes to, uh, to uh, uh, Cornelius' house. And when he comes to Cornelius' house, there's a whole group of people that are there waiting, ready, and assembled to hear the message. Cornelius had called his nearest friends. He had called his, his, uh, his family members to come here. And so I don't know, while Peter's on his way up there to uh, Caesarea, I don't know what his expectations were, but I promise you it wasn't that. 
This would be like somebody calling uh, Pastor Bradford here and telling him, hey, I want you to know that I've got, I've got a family member that lives, yes, in Walsh, Colorado, of all places. And uh, they, they're, not, they're not very receptive to the gospel message from me, but maybe if they hear it from somebody else like you, maybe it'll make a difference. And so your pastor says, okay, well, I'll be glad to do that. And they say, there's just one more thing. My sister is a transgender and is also gay. Now the expectations change a little bit, don't they? Imagine that, that he's thinking, he goes with his wife, they go to knock on this door and they're just thinking, I don't know what difference this is going to make. Person opens the door and welcomes them with open arms and says, Pastor, my sister told me you were coming and I've invited all my friends and I've invited all my family members and we are willing and ready to do whatever you tell us to do. Whoa. Now it's going to take him a few minutes to pick his jaw up off the floor, but then he's going to give him the gospel. That'd be a great thing. I, I don't know if that's what it was like for Peter, but I imagine that's what it's like. He never saw himself going to the Gentiles. He never saw himself going to a Gentile city and to a Roman soldier. And yet when he shows up at this man's house, there's a house full of people eager and ready to hear the message that Peter had to say. And what Peter explains to his audience shows us this. He got the message God wanted him to get. In verse number 28, he says, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. See, what he's saying is that for as long as you've known, Jews have nothing to do with Gentiles. They knew that they were... They were Apostle Paul describes Gentiles... Aliens from the, commonwealth of, uh, from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. They knew that while they feared the God of Israel, that they were really on the outside looking in. And for much of Peter's life, that was his perspective as well. But Peter goes on to say this, But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Notice, he doesn't say beasts. He doesn't say wild. He doesn't say creeping things. He doesn't say fowls of the air. No, he says, God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. In other words, here's what Peter is communicating to them, is that for all of my life, I viewed Gentiles as being up on the sheet, as being unclean, as being off limits, as being beyond the scope of God's grace and unworthy of God's mercy. That's how I always view Gentiles, as though they were on the sheet. But God has shown me this, that what He has cleansed, I have no right to consider off limits. In other words, whom God is willing to save, I have no right to say that they are beyond salvation. I don't know if we've got any young people in here that play video games. Anybody? Anybody play video games in here? Okay. No, not any. Wow. Man, we are in Walsh, Colorado, right? Farm boys, that's good for you. I'm glad to hear that. Well, when you buy a video game, they come with certain ratings on them. And so you've got games that are rated MA for mature, that would be 18 and older. You've got games that are rated T for teen, which would be 13 and, and up. And then you've got those that are rated E. And that means they're rated for That means no matter what your age level is, no matter what your skill level is, no matter what your experience level is, you can do a great job at this game. That's what it means. Well, if you'll just bear with me for illustration's sake, for most of Peter's life, he believed that the gospel was rated J for Jews. That it was limited specifically to God's people, to the people of Israel. And what God is doing in his Acts chapter 10 is he is showing Peter that the gospel is actually rated E for everyone. That it's not just limited to the Jews. It's not just limited to the, pros the proselyte or to a particular group of people or, or a particular religious system. But that the gospel is available and it, it, it is for every person on the face of this earth. Even for those that we might say it's not. Even for those who live lifestyles like the people of Boulder. 
even for those who fly the rainbow flag, even for those who are professing atheists, even for those who operate abortion clinics, even for those who burn cities down and are rioting and looting in the streets. Yes, those members of particular groups, whether we're talking about the BLM group or if we're talking about the Antifa organization, that in red-blooded American minds, we may have written a long time ago. What God is telling us here is that we have no right to put people on the sheet, if I can say it that way. We have no place of limiting the gospel to any particular group of people or any particular group uh, or, or particular place. See, the Lord's at work to show Peter and to help him understand that the gospel is for everyone. So you know what he did? He moved Peter to take the gospel to Cornelius. And here's why. Because no soul is beyond salvation. And for the very same reason, we've got to be willing to take the gospel to cities like Boulder. And we've got to be willing to take the gospel to cities like Seattle and Portland and Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, Maryland. And we've got to be willing to take the gospel to places like North Korea and China and Iran and Afghanistan. These places that maybe for a long time in our minds, they have been on the sheet. God is telling us tonight, no, I am able to save anyone, anywhere, anytime. And it's our responsibility like Peter to get on board with God's plan. See, there is no sinner that cannot be savaged. I've been in a few car accidents in my life, I've got to admit to you. And uh, the first time I was in a car accident, it was late night on the way home after a wedding out of town. And I fell asleep at the wheel. I ended up in the ditch, breaking a fence down. But all I did in my car was break my radiator. So I was able to get the radiator repaired and everything was hunky-dory after that. And then when I went to college, I got in an accident my freshman year. And uh, I, I was at an intersection and a police officer was in front of me. And the light turns green, so the police officer goes through the intersection. And I follow him through the intersection. Well, the problem is that the person coming from the other way thought it was green for some reason. And so they decided to just come right on through at 45 miles an hour and smacked me in the fender, spun me around, tore up the whole passenger side of my car. But I'm so thankful for an auto body shop like Little Rick's. And they were able to fix that car up, get me back on the road in just a couple of weeks, and that was a blessing. But there was one accident that I was in in particular, again at an intersection, a place where you'd think you'd be safe. But I'm going uh, like every good independent fundamental Baptist does. I'm going five over the speed limit, 45 and a 40. And I'm approaching the intersection. And, and I see that coming the opposite way is somebody wanting to turn left. And I did what every good independent fundamental Baptist does. And I said, don't you dare in front of me. And he did anyways. And so he pulls out. And so I slammed on my brakes. I slowed down to 40 miles an hour. And uh, then the car behind him proceeded to come out as well. Now, I'm already in the intersection. There's no stopping here. And Now, I was driving a 1998 Saturn SC2. If you don't know what that is, it's plastic on a frame. <laughs> and this older gentleman was driving a 1970-something Ford Thunderbird. If you don't know what that is, it's like a brick wall on wheels. And I felt every ounce of that brick wall plowed into him. It just broke like a ball joint on his. And my hood was smashed up to my windshield. Airbags blew out and everything. Smacked my head on the airbags on the steering wheel. It was a total marked for destruction, unsalvageable. Now, can I say to you tonight that I'm so thankful that there are no total losses with God. See, the truth of the matter is that, that God is able to salvage any kind of sinner that you could imagine. That no matter how bad your sin is, no matter how messed up your life has been, no, how, no matter how many drugs you've shot into your body, no matter how many bottles of alcohol you've consumed, and no matter how many kind of lifestyles you've lived, the reality is this, that God can save any person from whatever messed up situation that they come from, and, and we have no place saying who God can and cannot save. This includes the transgenders. 
This includes the homosexual. This includes the atheist and the agnostic and the skeptic and the Hindu and the Muslim and the, the, the Mormon and the Jehovah's Witness. I mean, any person, it, and there's so many people in here tonight that you could probably say, if God saved me, he can save anybody. That is certainly the truth. No soul is beyond salvation. But perhaps our problem is that while we understand that in our head, a lot of times it has trouble getting into our hearts. A lot of times we don't allow it to affect change in our lives. To bring us to the place, not just where we know in our brains that God can save anybody of any situation and any lifestyle, but to where that truth moves us to the point where we ourselves take a gospel track and give it to somebody wearing a rainbow flag. And give it to somebody who has piercings all over their faces. Or somebody who's panhandling on the street corner. We, we understand the truth that no soul is, salva- is beyond salvation is in our head. We know that. But too often we don't let it affect our hearts and move us to give them the gospel. But the truth is, is that the gospel is not limited only to people who we think are prime opportunities. Nor is the gospel limited to any particular place. The gospel is not just for the Bible Belt. It's not just for the conservative southern regions of our country. No, the gospel is for liberal cities and liberal states all over this country. And the gospel is for countries that aren't just open to the gospel, but it's for countries that are closed to the gospel. It's for those places like North Korea and Iran and Afghanistan and other places where missionaries have a hard time getting through. Hey, listen, it's not our place to place limitations upon the gospel. In fact, the only reason I'm saved is because God placed zero limitations upon the gospel. And the truth is, that's your testimony tonight as well. See, He is still calling out of every tribe and nation a people for his name. And if we're going to reach those unexpected peoples in the unexpected places, then we too, like Peter, must come to the understanding and the realization that no soul is beyond salvation. So I would just ask you some questions in conclusion. Are there people in your mind right now that you might consider to be unsalvageable? It might be a longtime friend might be a wayward child. It might be an uncle or an aunt or a parent. Somebody that you've tried to give the gospel to so many times and they've rejected it so many times that you just begin to wonder, maybe they're beyond God's ability to save. We may not utter that here, but we may think it here. Or have you given up on that person that flies the rainbow flag? Or have you given up on Democrats? <laughs> Liberals. Well, hey, listen, while we might give up on some, God has not. And neither should you. He's still at work chipping away at our false notions. He's still calling missionaries to go to China and North Korea. He's still calling families like ours to plant churches in cities like Boulder. And he's meeting here with us tonight breaking down barriers and pulling down strongholds that keep us from taking the gospel to places we never expected. God's love and His reach is not limited to any particular people, and neither should ours be. So, since we know that no soul is beyond salvation, let's be careful as God's people to take the gospel to every person in every place. And I think we'll be amazed to see what God will do in a place like Boulder. Father, we come to you tonight and thank you for the opportunity to be in your word. And I'm thankful for your congregation that's here tonight. And Lord, I pray that you would use the word of God to help us to view lost people the way that you do. And that's not hopeless, not unredeemable, unreachable, Every person on the face of this earth, no matter what kind of background they come from, is well within your reach, well within your ability to save. 
And so would you please help us to see people that way and help that knowledge to move us in our hearts to take the gospel to people we may not expect to receive it. And I pray that you would work in hearts and bring about the change that's needed. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.